Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Oliver Twist as read by Lord Naren White. Lots, cried Fagin, holding up his hands. I haven't so much as would. I don't know how much you've got, but I dare say you hardly know yourself, as it would take a pretty long time to count it, said Sykes. But I must have some tonight, and that's flat. Well, well, said Fagin with a sigh. I'll send the artful round presently. You won't do nothing of the kind, rejoined Mr. Sykes. The artful is a deal too artful, and would forget to come, or lose his way, or get dodged by traps, and so be prevented or anything for an excuse, if you put him up to. Nancy shall go to the ken and fetch her, to make all sure. I'll lie down and have a snooze while she's gone. After a great deal of haggling and squabbling, Fagin beat down the amount of the required advance from five pounds to three pounds, four and sixpence, protesting with many solemn asseverations that that would only leave him eighteen pence to keep the house with. Mr. Sykes suddenly remarking that if he couldn't get any more, he must accompany him home. With the Dodger and Master Bates put the eatables in the cupboard, the Jew then, taking leave of his affectionate friend, returned homeward, attended by Nancy and the boys, Mr. Sykes, meanwhile, flinging himself on the bed and composing himself to sleep away during the time until the young lady's return. In due course, they arrived at Fagin's abode, where they found Toby Crackett and Mr. Chitling intent upon their fifteenth game at cribbage, which is, it, which it is scarcely necessary to say, that, to say the latter gentleman lost and with it his fifteenth and last sixpence, much to the amusement of his young friends. Mr. Crackett, apparently somewhat ashamed at being found relaxing himself with the gentleman, so much inferior in station, and mental endowments yawned, and inquiring after Sykes took up his hat to go. "'Has nobody been but Toby?' "'Has nobody been, Toby?' asked Fagin. "'Not a living leg,' answered Mr. Crackett, pulling up his collar. It's been as dull as swipes. You ought to stand something some, something handsome. Fagin, to recompense me for keeping house so long. Damn. I'm as flat as a juryman. And should have gone to sleep as fast as Newgate. If I hadn't had the good nature to amuse this youngster. Horrid dull. I'm blessed if I ain't. With these and other ejaculations of the same kind, Mr. Toby Crackett swept up his winnings and crammed them into his waistcoat pocket with a haughty air, as though such small pieces of silver were wholly beneath the consideration of a man of his figure. This done, he swaggered out of the room, with so much elegance and gentility, that Mr. Chitling, bestowing numerous admiring glances on his legs and boots till they were out of sight, assured the company that he considered his acquaintance cheap at fifteen pences, uh, an interview and that he didn't value his losses the snap of his little finger. "'What a rum chap you are, Tom,' said Master Bates, highly amused by this declaration. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'Am I, Fagin?' "'A very clever fellow, my dear,' said Fagin, patting him on the shoulder and winking to his other pupils. "'And Mr. Mr. Crackett is a heavy swell, ain't he, Fagin?' asked Tom. "'No doubt at all of that, my dear.' And it's a creditable thing to have his acquaintance, ain't it, Fagin? pursued Tom. Very much so, indeed, my dear. They're only jealous, Tom, because he won't give it to them. Ah, cried Tom, triumphantly. That's where it is. He has cleaned me out. But I can go and earn some more, when I like, can't I, Fagin? To be sure you can, and the sooner you go, the better, Tom. So make up your loss at once, and don't lose any more time, Dodger. Charlie. It's time you were on the lay. Come, it's near ten, nothing done yet. In obedience to this hint, the boys nodding to Nancy took up their hats and left the room, the dodger and his vivacious friend indulging, as they went in many witticisms at the very at the expense of Mr. Chitling, in whose conduct it is but justice to say there was nothing very conspicuous or peculiar 
inasmuch as there are a great number of spirited young bloods upon town, who pay a much higher price than Mr. Chitling for being seen in good society, and a great number of fine gentlemen composing the society, composing the good society aforesaid, who establish their reputation upon very much the same footing as Flash Toby Crackett. Now, said Fagin, when they had left the room, I'll go and get you that cash, Nancy. This is the only key of a little cupboard, where I keep a few odd things the boys get, my dear. I never lock up my money, for I've got none to lock up, my dear. <laughs> none to lock up. It's a poor trade, Nancy, and no thanks, but I'm fond of seeing the young people about me, and I bear it all. I bear it all, hush, he said, hastily concealing the key in his breast. Who's that? Listen. The girl who was sitting at the table with her arms folded, appeared in no way interested in the arrival, or to care whether the person, whoever he was, came or went until the murmur of a man's voice reached her ears. The instant she caught the sound, she tore off her bonnet and shawl, with the rapidity of lightning, and thrust them under the table. The Jew, turning round immediately afterwards, she muttered a complaint of the heat, in a tone of languor that contrasted very remarkably, with the extreme haste and violence of this action, which, however, had been unobserved by Fagin, who had his back towards her at the time. Bah! he whispered, as though nettled by the interruption. It's the man I expected before. He's coming downstairs. Not a word about the money while he's here. Nance, he won't stop long. Not ten minutes, my dear. Laying his skinny forefinger upon his lip, the Jew carried a candle to the door as a man's step was heard upon the stairs without. He reached it at the same moment as the visitor, who, coming hastily into the room, was close upon the girl before he observed her. It was Monks. Only one of my young people, said Fagin, observing that Monks drew back on beholding a stranger. Don't move, Nancy. The girl drew closer to the table, and, glancing at Monks with an air of careless levity, withdrew her eyes. But, as he turned towards Fagin, she stole another look, so keen and searching and full of purpose, that if there had been any bystander to observe the change, he could hardly have believed the two looks to have proceeded from the same person. Any news? inquired Fagin. Great. And in good? asked Fagin, hesitating as though he feared to vex the other man by being too sanguine. Not bad anyway, replied Monks with a smile. I have been prompt enough this time. Let me have a word with you. The girl drew closer to the table and made no offer to leave the room, although she could see that Monks was pointing to her. The Jew, perhaps fearing she might say something aloud about the money, if he endeavored to get rid of her, pointed upward and took Monks out of the room. Not that infernal hole we were in before, she could hear the man say as they went upstairs. Fagin laughed and making some reply which did not reach her, seemed by the creaking of the boards to lead his companion to the second story. Before the sound of their footsteps had ceased to echo through the house, the girl had slipped off her shoes, and drawing her gown loosely over her head, and muffling her arms in it, stood at the door, listening with breathless interest. The moment the noise ceased, she glided from the room, ascended the stairs with incredible softness and silence, and was lost in the gloom above. The room remained deserted for a quarter, uh, an, uh, for a quarter of an hour or more. The girl glided back with the same unearthly tread, and immediately afterwards the two men were heard descending. Monks went at once into the street, and the Jew crawled upstairs again for the money. When he returned, the girl was adjusting her shawl and bonnet, as if preparing to be gone. "'Why, Nance!' exclaimed the Jew, starting back as he put down the candle. "'How pale you are!' pale, echoed the girl, shading her eyes with her hands, as if to look steadily at him. Quite horrible. What have you been doing to yourself? And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, <coughs> comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and Thanks again.